Hello and welcome to The Extra Edge, a sports analytics podcast powered by Connexon Sports. I'm Dave Grinzinski, and today we're talking with Kostas Hatsikristos, who is the head of performance at Fenerbahce, a major Turkish multi-sport club in Istanbul, Turkey. He works with the men's basketball team there, and he's also the director of the EuroLeague Strength and Conditioning Association. Postus, I just want to first thank you for taking some time to join us here on The Extra Edge. David, thank you very much. And uh, like I have to, t- have to say that I'm impressed by the correct pronunciations of all these difficult names. So <laughs> you got a point there. Well, you have the honor of having the most difficult last name to pronounce on this podcast other than mine. So <laughs> so you got that going for you. That's a you know, which I usually carry, you know, this everywhere I go. It's just like, what is that? How many, how many letters? So thank you for the, for the invite. No, no problem. You know, and the other thing is I know you're a researcher in the field of sports biomechanics. And today we're going to be talking a lot of hoops. But can we start by, can you give us a little detail about your role at Fenerbahce and your, your day-to-day? Um, the role is um, I'm the head strength and conditioning coach uh, here at Fenner, and uh, I'm uh, also responsible for um, coordinating the medical staff and, and the rehab staff and all the people that are involved uh, with the players. So we have everybody that has a you know an effect on player performance, then it's uh, you know it's uh, it's my role to coordinate their actions and also connect the medical staff with the coaches. So they have, uh, I, I, they know exactly what's going on in our, in our department and we just uh, try to seamlessly operate. And, and that's probably one of the biggest challenges in sports out there is this seamless integration of, of the, the, the different uh, sub teams that work in, in, uh, that exist in a, in a sports team. So that's my main role here. And, you know, besides the everyday stuff of training, uh, now the new thing is load management and uh, planning the, the 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 season and planning the practices on a weekly, monthly, and annual basis. I uh, working with rehabs, uh, with post rehabs, and it's quite a, a wide range of of, uh, of responsibilities of the modern strength coach, I guess. Well, we are going to be talking about load management, and you're doing great work over there because your your men's team once again at the top of the standings. You just won another Turkish national cup. And before you arrived in Turkey, you spent eight years in Moscow as the head of performance for Seska. And you were part of a team that made it to nine consecutive Final Fours. You were there for seven of them. And you were there when Seska won its seventh title in two, 2016. Ironically, you beat Fenerbahce in the final. Now, yeah, a lot of people I'm, that are here now were part of these teams. So that was, uh, that's you know, how life, life, life brings things, huh? Hey, if you can't beat them, join them. And on this podcast, Coach, we talk about how coaches collect sports data and then use it to get insights and take action. Data, insights, and action. So let's start with data. When did you start using data and why? Well, uh, I come from a generation of coaches that data was uh, not readily available. Uh, I'm talking about the mid-2000s and on. So back when I started, the data was uh, pretty simple uh, in, a, in, a, in a team setting. You could get you know, vertical jump uh, measurements, you can get body fats, you can get weights and, and a few other things you had. If you were lucky enough to have uh, time engaged, you could get some, some measurements there. But generally, research and, and data collection was uh, mostly uh, happening in a lab. And so that, that's why a lot of us uh, from from my generation of coaches, did not pick to uh, to to continue doing a PhD because it was going to be lab work, and we we were in love with sports and coaching, and we wanted to have to work with athletes, and uh, and and so we picked a different route. But things have changed, and now with the um, the advancement of technology, Connection is, is a prime example. Um, now you can we collect tons of data, and uh, there's the the the, 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 uh, oh, the ability to collect whatever basically you want. So to the point where it's almost too much and uh, sometimes we don't know what to do about it. So um, right there at around 2010, 11, it became obvious that this is uh, becoming a big thing. And my first uh, attempt to to get into uh, to GPS and uh, wearable, I'd say wearable technology to get uh, to get my hands on wearable technology was 2015 when I was in Seska, tried out a, a startup company um, that produced one of the first uh, sensors and play around with that that product and uh, sadly this this company didn't continue but then it got me into this uh into this mindset and and the thinking of 
of collecting data and and starting basing our work more on on a, on uh, some objective uh, measurements rather than just the field, which we should not underestimate. But it's great to have uh, data. And up at that time, it was only heart rate, and just like uh, wearing vests in these newer technologies and uh, um, LPS, GPS, IMUs. Uh, there's always a problem with basketball players to wear stuff around their waist. So even that heart rate that was available before was not too handy for us. So we didn't really use it because players didn't want to wear the sensors. So after that, you know, I became obsessed with finding, uh, quote unquote, the truth. I'm one of these people that usually uh, representatives of companies don't like talking to me because I'll ask a million questions about how things work, even if it, you know, most of the times I don't understand half of it. But then I'll go back and, and try to find out but trying to find out what makes sense, what really is necessary. And the main question is, how is it going to um, benefit our team? So it's been a journey that is continuing and, uh, you know, obviously it's going to continue, hopefully. Well, this is great because this is what we hope to accomplish with this podcast. So to help answer, you know, some of those coaches for uh, some of those questions for coaches and, and, and clear the air a little bit. And, and you're using IMU, correct? And so can you talk a little bit about that just over like like the advantages you see using IMU and, and what the data, you know, the kind of data you're collecting? Uh, we'll, you know, basically we're collecting all the data that, that this system can provide. Obviously, it would be better to have an LPS system uh, right now. I think that for our purposes, the IMU is, uh, um, is a good start, I would say, to get the whole organization to get into this um, uh, to the to the culture of collecting data, the culture of sharing data, and start using this data to make decisions. Because um, it's besides the scientific uh, aspect of things, which of course I would love to get the best and the the, the fullest product that I can get my hands on. But it, the way it works, especially the way it works in Europe, and I think it, it, the way it works in, in most organizations before they go in, uh, go ahead and make a considerable, let's say, investment, you have to, to take a step-by-step step to start using the, the, the simpler product and then continue to, to work with, uh, with the more advanced products and, and really immerse the whole organization into that. Um, IMU is great for us because first, um, we, we, we do use the, the raw data of, of what the system can provide for some further analysis, uh, some more biomechanical uh, applications that we try to, to apply. And uh, it just gives us the, all the information that we want in terms of loading, in terms of uh, acceleration, decelerations, and, and the main, uh, let's say, metrics that we are interested in. Uh, so I'm used fine. It's, it's great for, for, what, for what we do. It's uh, obviously simpler, simpler to use, simpler to, to set up. We can carry it with us. So it, it's, I think it's a sound choice for, for our needs. So the EuroLeague season, that is a grind. Coach, I mean, I've talked, I've talked to to other people, you know, involved with the league, and and so, I mean, can you speak to that a little bit, uh, just how 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 different it is uh, in Europe uh, as far as how the season plays out, and then where the data kind of plays a role in all of that. Okay. So that that's a qu- question that I can talk for for for, um, for uh, them for long. So here, here's the big. Uh, so for for your listeners that maybe are not so familiar with the European setup, uh, uh, we are uh, the the best. Let's say the top clubs in Europe compete uh, obviously in their national leagues. So Spanish teams uh, compete in, in the Spanish league, uh, Turkish leagues and Turkish league, Greek leagues and so uh, Greek teams and Greek leagues and so on and so forth. But the top teams also compete in uh, in, in the Euro League, which is um, a European league that consists of 18 teams. So we play. One once a week, week you play for your national league, and twice a week, uh, once or twice a week you play for the Euro League. That brings up the density of the games uh, to about three to four per week, and uh, um, travel is involved because you have to travel from country to country and from city to city. Uh, the density is, like I said, three to four uh, games per per week, and the total number of games could be over eighty for the teams that pers- uh, that, that progress to the final four and all so on and so forth. So you get a very intense uh, competition. The the one of the differences that that exists be, be, between the Euroleague and the NBA, for example, because it's comparable, and the Euroleague has been ranked as the second league globally uh, under the NBA in terms of uh, of competition. So it's it's a pretty serious competition, and. Uh, 
the biggest difference is that every that like the motto of the Euro League is every game matters. So you have to win every game. Yeah, if you lose two games in a row, you go from third in the standings to maybe tenth. It's only eighteen teams, so it's very very competitive, which means that it's very difficult to to do what people say talk about load management and things like that. Uh, furthermore, you have certain restrictions in your national league. You can't use all your players because you have to to support the local players. So that brings an imbalance in the team to where you have to, you know, uh, play with some of your international players in one league, and you cannot use the same in the in the local league. So now tracking all this uh, all this activity becomes a challenge, and that's where having uh, consistently collecting data is super important. The biggest one, the, the, one of the biggest problems that we have is the players that don't compete in the Euro League because, or the, the National League, they're usually under trained. And that's where we go in and we 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 measure, you know, all, all the metrics that we collect: uh, total to mechanical load, uh, acceleration in the high zones, and things like that. And we try to match. Uh, so basically, we try to match the the game intensity and the practice intensity with this compensation workouts, so we can keep uh, our guys in shape. Those who play, those who doesn't, we don't play. So um, the Euroleague is a, is a very competitive environment. I will have to add that. Uh, play, the best players of of all the, the Euroleague league teams usually have to compete in the national team, so they th that's something that uh, you know some some uh, colleagues in the U.S. cannot really understand is that our guys never get rest. Some the, our best guys almost never get rest because once the league is over, we go into the summer. They have national team. They get back. They rest for a week. We start our our season. So they they, they play around the clock. So collecting data and tracking these guys is is absolutely vital. So, I mean, these are professional basketball players in the Euro League. In your experience, were they accepting the data when you were started to use it and, and started to make that transition from being a non-data coach to a data coach? Were, were the pros all in on this? Well, I, I can't say they were all in on this. The, the first uh, major, uh, let's say, the, the, the person that I had to convince first was my coach. And I was lucky to, to have been with a coach for 10 years, the same coach for 10 years, Coach this. And uh, we established a, a good relationship over the years, so he the trust was built gradually. So that that was the first um, the first big sale I have to make because obviously, if the coach doesn't support all this uh, uh, activity, or doesn't support this culture, then it's not gonna it's not gonna work, right? So, uh, coach was the first, then he g he gave uh, full support to whatever we wanted to do. Then the players were, was a different story initially. Uh, there was reluctance. And I remember when I had this the first conversation with the captain of, of Ceska Moscow, uh, which is a very traditional team, very successful. So it's it's a lot of pressure also from the players and to the players. And I told him that, listen, we want to run this uh, project. We want you guys to wear these devices. Uh, back then, it was only vests. And it's okay, please wear the vest, blah, blah, blah. But the whole thing was, I remember one, uh, uh, something that he told me is that, that he said, you know, we'll go ahead and do it, but you know that players always want to protect themselves against coaches. And that to me, you know, he's, he was a veteran. He was like a 30 something year old veteran. And that was really strange uh, to, to hear it come out like that, straight in a, like that. And I told him, listen, it's not about you protecting yourself. It's about us getting more information so we can help you. So I was also addressing a generation of players that had this mentality that I want to keep my space between the coaching staff and our and myself. Whereas now this generation that we are trying to, to change that and say, okay, the closest you work with me, the more I'm going to be able to help you. And there's still some doubt. I had another player that we had to sit him, sit him out uh, for, uh, from a game because we wanted to play another player. It's nothing to do with loading or on anything like that. And he came up, you know, day later came to me, says, I don't want to wear the sensor anymore. I said, why? Because you guys probably saw I'm tired and you kept me out, but I'm 28 years old. I want to play all the games. I said, it has nothing to do with it. So, you know, getting closer to the players, getting them to trust you and, and getting them used to, to interacting with data is very important. I, I must say that it's becoming easier because there's more interaction. Now we have questionnaires. We have, we ask for RPEs and things like that. Now, this year was the easiest year in terms of uh, just here's your, in terms of compliance, we just give them the sensors that wear it. I, it was a huge step for me, as funny as it sounds, 
and I've been saying, to, telling this to everybody, the fact that Connection came up with this clip and the, and, the, and the pocket that you can put on the shorts, it was a game changer for basketball, at least in my experience and in, for European basketball. And it's not an advertisement, but it is what it is. If so many, I have uh, colleagues that failed in their attempt to introduce data because players wouldn't wear the vests. And that, that's it, finish. You're very smart, great product. Player doesn't wear the product, you don't have a project. So to me, it was, uh, it, it, it really helped that just this simple feature. Huh? Well, and I was going to ask you that if, you know, the European players was, the, what was the tipping point or what is there a tipping point outside of, you know, being able to, to put, you know, have the clip on the sensor, you know, and wear it in the shorts. What is there one particular metric or is there something that really just catches their eye and say, okay, this might actually be useful for me, whether it's a coach or a player in your, in Europe? I, I, I don't think it's a one metric that because players don't don't care about metrics. You know that they just want to get the big picture <laughs> whenever they want. But one thing that that really helped me, besides so, besides all the the technical information that we get, if we should push in the practice more or push less, or if we have to rest a player, and we can go into that in more detail if you want later on in the in the talk. But the fact that I had data in my on, in my hands and I could show people what we're doing and what they are doing. Help me both with the players. So, example, there was a there's a need also in the NBA. There's the same need. I know that after every game, if you don't play a lot, you have to practice. You have to lift. You have to run. You have to do whatever the coach uh, wants you to do. Uh, in my opinion, one or uh, one of the main things in our compensation workouts is running. You have to get in some running changes of directions and jumps. If the environment allows, that means if we have a court after the the official game or Okay, so players, no player wants to work out after a game, especially if you didn't get the minutes you wanted to get. You're not in the mood to train. You don't understand why you, you have to train. So when I presented them with their data and they saw how throughout half of the week they, they were severely underloaded because you have the, the game day that you don't play. You have the day before that you don't participate in practice that much because you're not going to play. And then you have the next day that is the day off. Out of the seven days, you're out three. And then if you are called to play in this nationally that, that I just explained, and you had three days of light practice, and then you go into a game situation. So just showing our players, some of our players, this data, I said, listen, this is where you are, and this is where you need to be. We need to do something to catch up. It's not a punishment. It's not, I know you, you don't have, I tell, I tell them, you don't have to smile at me. You don't have to, to talk to me. Just go and do the work and proceed because it's your future. That's one thing. And then the other one I, I had, when, when, when I needed to, I had data to talk to the coaches uh, about us needed to, to practice less, us needed to practice more, or if you want, to, if, if a player needs more rest. And that's huge because up to that point, it was an, a, a fight between opinions. It's my opinion. No, no, it's my opinion. I know better. You know how coaches think. They always want to have the last word. And, and rightly so. It's their responsibility at the end of the day. But just having data and uh, presenting them with objective uh, measurements, it, it was a game changer. And it came to a point, and then that was surprising to me that coach would ask me, like, well, what, what did your data say? Well, what do you, you say this? Is, did you see something in the data? Without him, them, without him understanding exactly what we're looking at, but she liked the fact that we had something else other than our opinion to, to support our work. So that was the two main things that, that I, you know, all the system have, have the, the flaws or their, or the great, uh, let's say, point, but for me, it was great that, that I, had, I could have this, uh, this data available. Okay, well, you know, okay, so the players don't care about the metrics, but we do, right? And so I'm curious, I, you know, and I know you, you mentioned there are so many things you can track. And, and I always, I, I ask everybody who comes on, you know, if they have a top three. So I'm very curious to find out, you know, because load management is so big for you, you know, with all the games you're playing and, and you know, in, in the short amount of time. Do you have a top three? I mean, you don't have to get, if you don't want to give away any secrets, I'm fine with that, but I'm just curious. Do you have a top three that you lean on? I don't, I don't think there's any any top secrets held anymore with, with the social media explosion. But for us, um, accelerations in the high and very high zones are probably the most important metric. And I know other people talked about that and we talk about it between us. Uh, distance per minute for me is important um, because it shows kind of like what the intensity of the practice might be. Uh, so I, we tend to fo uh, also maximal speed is important to see if we uh, if we reach our, our values and that's more for this individual compensation workouts that we use 
But acceleration, uh, a total acceleration load is obviously one that, that we focus on. And really, these are the main ones that we track. And I, I want to say that obviously it's important to, to, uh, to track. It's impor important to monitor throughout the season, throughout the, for a long period of time to try to get insights. And this is, I think, the only way you can get, an in, get insight is if you track over time. That's why it takes time to understand what the particular metric means for your team, for the individual. Uh, as we all know, that some, some uh, players have higher values just because they, that's, their, the stat, that's how they train. They train harder uh, and others don't. So just looking at the data and say, oh, this guy didn't work hard today. It can be a million things. It can be the coach didn't play the place for him. It, it could be just having a bad day. It could be anything. So just looking at a couple of practices and making decisions, I don't think is uh, the more optimal way to, to treat data. But getting the, those metrics that we just talked about and try to, to, to track over time and use them for other applications is, I think, the, our, our, main, our main use of, of the data, of the metrics. Well, I think what's very interesting about you is all your experience with the European players, the European professional players, you know, the national teams and, 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 and everything else. You also have experience with the American game. You got your master's at the University of Texas. You did an internship in Arizona and then your first job at the University of Georgia. So you understand the college game. And so when you look at the two, are there differences between the games when it comes to the data collection and or the insights that, that you get? Would you say or just in general, are there differences? I believe there are big differences. Now, data is data, and you're going to collect them the same way and analyze them in your way. Uh, the biggest difference between college and, and pro uh, pro basketball is obviously the age of the players. In college, you get kids from 18 to 22, 23 max. Um, they're all in their, you know, they're all young. They're most probably, they're they're more or less healthy. Uh, where and they have a different mindset getting into college of of developing of of uh, of getting better of reaching their goals, whether these goals are financial or their goals are, um, are just career goals. I know it, it has changed. Um, the, late, the last few years, it has changed because of the changes that, that we see in college basketball with the new, uh, um, uh, you, see, you know, this, uh, the fact that the players are getting paid now and it's just changing, shifting the, the whole atmosphere over there. But it's, it still remains that the guys are, that the athletes are younger. The athletes are, are, are in different phase of their careers. And the game itself is different. The, the shot clock, for example, is longer. And that makes the it changes the game. Now, exactly how it changes it in terms of data, I don't know because I don't have the data from college, but definitely doesn't apply to our game. And just playing with, uh, with full adults and 30, 35-year-old veterans versus playing with, with 18-year-old um, peers is, is definitely going to be, uh, is definitely going to change the way you approach practice, the, the, the rest and, and everything that, that's re that, that revolves around training. So well, definitely there are differences. But the other thing too, though, is, you know, we talk so much about load management, the grind that the, that the pro season has, you know, I mean, college is, 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 is kind of getting there. Almost everybody makes a tournament. It seems, I mean, it used to be just the big dance in the NIT, but now you get the CBI. I mean, you know, so, I mean, almost every team, I mean, should expect to be, to be playing in the postseason. So I have to believe that the load management conversations are now really spilling into the college game as well. What do you think, or have you heard anything? It should it should spill uh, and it, load management. It's a it's a very broad definition. It's a very broad term. It can be anything. Some people think load management is just if somebody's tired, we just don't put them to play, or we cut uh, we cut people from practicing or, or things. They can be anything for 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 depending on the situation and the philosophy of the coach, right? So, but the fact that you have to look at the relationship between work and rest, uh, you have to look at the relationship between what you, what your input is in, in, in practices in, in the weight room or wherever whenever you uh, interact with the players with a player and you have to, to see how that affects your performance and any adjustment that needs to be made either on the training side or the rest side uh, that's load management that that must be taken into consideration and I've been with coaches that didn't really look into that and said okay players are that we need to practice we need to play we need to practice we need to play and any talk about, hey, listen, we're, I think we're overtrained or we undertrained was just a, a fight for opinion. So load management, I think, should happen in, in any level. It doesn't mean that, again, that you should 
keep players out of playing. That's just one extreme example. The only time that we do it is when we are afraid that somebody must might get hurt. Otherwise, you play. It doesn't matter whatever your, your data show. But tracking players is important. So that's why you need to have as many tools as you can to track them on the court. Uh, you know, wearables, great example. Track them in the weight room, track their rest, track their uh, their wellness. So that's the, the the main areas I think you need to, to focus in. Again, it doesn't matter which level you play. You have to do it. Well, and I think you made a great point about having a player ready, not only for the team that they're playing for right now, but also if you are playing for a national team or, you know, the Olympics are coming up or you got, you know, a World Cup or so, something something coming up outside of your, your typical day-to-day, you know, you have to be ready for that. So managing the load isn't like you mentioned. It's not about just you're tired and you got to sit. It's also about being prepared every time the coach calls your name. But well, that, that's the that's the, the the final. Let's say the the end all of all of, of our training is. I have to keep you, I have to keep you healthy. And in Euroleague, in my in, in our environment, the, maybe the main concern of our, of our staff or the strength and conditioning staff and the perform and then the medical staff is to keep people healthy. So much practice, so much, so many games, uh, too much travel, not enough time to practice. So keeping people healthy is, is one part. But keeping. Um, Trying to maintain the best performance shape that you can throughout the season is, is the uh, the other big goal, obviously. And, and just like you said, you have to manage what you do every day. And what you do is not only you got to do more or less training. You have to rest more. You have to eat better. And I know a lot of a lot of colleagues uh, mentioned that in their uh, in their answers to in, in your podcast. But that's that's what it is. It's always trying to keep that balance of you know. Uh, how much training you, you you should have versus how much rest. And if you don't have some data, again, it becomes a battle of opinions and gut feelings and experience. And that's great. And you should always um, um, uh, take this into account, not underestimate somebody's experience or somebody's knowledge, but data is huge uh, into making those decisions. And it, and it makes it easier to communicate with everybody, athletes especially. Well, and I've I've watched a couple of your talks when you have a room full of coaches, and you mentioned uh, the toolbox, having your toolbox, and and when you said that, you know, I, I said I gotta ask him. So so because I I think some coaches, and I, I don't, I mean, I don't know. This is just my opinion. You know, maybe they're threatened by it. Maybe they think data and the analytics are you know are going to replace them at some point. But that is not what this is. I'm gonna ask you point blank. Is data a tool that you have in your toolbox and you use it to enhance your coaching and make some data-driven decisions? Obviously, you know, this is, of course, this is the, the, the main uh, cause for, 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 for using data is to help you. Uh, first of all, you have, the data will help you, uh, let's say, analyze your own work because you believe you're doing A, and you know you you design an intervention, you design an exercise, and you think this is going to have a certain adaptation, and that's great because that's what theory tells us, and your experience tells you. Uh, so do the data support that? So you you're doing a, an exercise in the weight room because you believe this will make me stronger. Well, is it actually making me stronger? Can can I measure that? So data, first of all, va- uh, is validates or not your work, so it can direct you to different uh, to different uh, actions, right? Uh, definitely, if you want to make a, de- a decision, you need to have some information. And how are you going to make a decision without data? Yes, you can make it because of experience, because you, you've done it so many times and you got some results. But because you mentioned tools and, tool, and, and tools available to the coach, yes, it's a very valuable tool to have uh, in, in, any, in any kind of situation. Data regarding player rec- recovery, data recover, uh, regarding the perception of the player that the players have for your own work for the workouts for the practices that's you know these are invaluable tools and it has changed it has changed the way we work at least it has changed the way i work right because now and i changed so many things in my practice uh, just by getting information and getting uh, validation or not validating my actions so definitely a tool a tool that is a must have so now let's talk about some of those validations let's talk about some of the insights that that you have picked up on and, and, you know, ones that stand out to you since you've been collecting data, what are some of the biggest insights you've gained from the data? The first, the first one, the most obvious one, uh, when we first start uh, organizing our data and organize, organizing our, uh, our culture around 
uh, having this type of information was that we changed. I was able to, to talk to, to my previous coach and, and uh, really change the way we practice on the, ga- on the days before the game. Maximum days we're going to have before a game in a EuroLeague is three. So, you know, a game minus three, minus two, minus one. Usually it's one or two days. But the way we practice, it was, it was long and it was intense. And it was long and intense on every practice. Game minus one, game minus two, game minus three. And we always said, and I got this feedback from the players. I saw it as a, as a person that is more, uh, uh, that's looking more at the physical development of the players and how they feel, how they perform. Uh, you know, I, I knew the, this was too much. Didn't have the right way to communicate it with the coach. It was always, oh, you know, we have to prepare. We have to run all these plays. We have to do this. We have to do that. But once we came in and we saw that, l- look at these loads on day, game minus three, minus two, mi- minus one. Look at this high and very high intensity zones that these guys have been in. Look at this distance that they ran. It should be declining as we go towards the game, as we approach the game. And that was the biggest, uh, that was the first thing that really stand out and we start talking about it. And it was not an easy sale because, you know, we changed because we had also some losses. And people was, oh, you know, we had terrible three-point percentage uh, long uh, and a lot of, you know, turnovers, things that usually are, um, are caused by fatigue. And we lost some games. We, we went back, talked about it, and said, hey, let, let's try to, to, to uh, change the way we practice. Let's try to adapt more into quality versus quantity and get this mind, mindset of hard, medium, and easy days. And the biggest conversation was, what is an easy day for you? What is it an easy day for me? And that's another big discussion because we, although we use the same words, we mean different things. <laughs> what are your numbers? It's okay, we, we need our load to be this, this much. We need our load to be that much. Okay. If we go over that, then we usually have problems. Is it a validated peer reviewed study? No. But for this team, you know, this is the trend. I see a trend and I have to tell you, you know, so uh, it did help us uh, change this, uh, the, the planning of the whole, the whole week and the whole month and the whole season. And uh, at the end, we, we, we found this common language and common ground. We didn't have to talk that much. Just say today, let's have an easy practice. We, need, we knew what that, that, that was this many minutes this drills and we're good to go. Uh, that was the, the biggest shifts uh, that we had the last two, three years is how we manage um, our pregame practices. And of well, course, another thing that is recurring, sorry to, to interrupt you, is uh, what we do with the, with the athletes that don't get enough minutes. We have 17 people on the roster and only 12 get to dress. So you, there's five players plus two, three more, five players that don't play at all, they don't dress, and two, three more that don't get minutes. So you understand it's almost having two different squads. So trying to match their metrics was also important for us. Well, and you don't have, this is my, you don't have to name names segment, but do you do you look back now and think, is there an aha moment where, you know, you, the insight, you, you collected the data, you, you, you had a theory based on, you know, you had some insights and then, you had a plan of action for a particular player or, or, or stretch of games or something. And you were like, man, if we didn't have the data, we probably wouldn't have done that. And it may not have worked out that way. Do you, have, do you think back uh, and have any of those kind of moments yet? I mean, I know we're still early on. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the aha moment was I can name a couple of, of games that we play, but people, you know, don't, if they don't follow European basketball, it's not that important, but we had two consecutive losses and match with, uh, three hard practices before the game. And that was the moment where I really decided to, hey, listen, I need, I need to, to, to do a better job, collect all the data, make a nice short presentation and just go ahead and, and present it to the coach. And, and that, was, uh, that was really a, a moment that, that made sense because we, we were hurting. You know, you change when you lose, you change when you're hurting. That's when you, uh, if you're smart, you're looking inside and introspecting what happened. So that was big. Another um, big moment was when we were trying to rehab players and on this return to play process where we, uh, our players started running and started using the court and started getting back into playing shape, uh, having data and having all of these details about how many jumps, uh, high intensity jumps, middle intensity jumps, uh, somebody might do, let's say somebody with a, with a, with a calf uh, injury. Uh, that was also important. Then we started having some idea of what exactly is happening and 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 planning things more carefully and more precisely, I would say. That was great to communicate with the athlete because we would communicate the results with the athlete and they say, okay, today we're just going to pick it up a notch and we're going to hit another number. We're going to go a little bit faster and we're going to cover more ground. And it gave us the opportunity to 
to really uh, go to really build our progression in rehab. So those two two uses are are really important for us and um, big changes that I, I like you said could stand out. So you're using IMU, and and one of the nice things about IMU is you can take it with you. You can take it with you on the road. Do you take it with you on the road for road games? Um, we do take it with, uh, with us, not with the frequency that, that I would like. Um, well, but, uh, we do use it in in, uh, in official games and official uh, games for the for the Turkish league, for the national league, where we allow to wear those wearables. Uh, we do take them. So because I want to have as much information that I uh, as I can get from games. Well, that's what I was saying. Because I mean, you you mentioned I heard you say one time you crossed like nine time zones in, in between games or something. You know, like these nineteen hour flights. Like it's insane. Like the the amount of travel you know that's involved. You know that I don't even think people take into consideration. You know, when you're playing the NBA, I mean, you go to Canada. You know, but maybe you go from New York to LA. But I mean, this is crazy. And so I'm just curious. You know, when you're taking, you know, you got the IMU with you on the road and you're going on these flights. And you know, I, 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 is it is the data telling you? Anything as far as the the travel and how that affects the the load and the load management? To be honest, that's a, that's a tough one. The guess is, uh, first of all, we haven't run any any type of official any type of studies on that, and that's something that actually I am talking with a um, with a, a university in Greece that we are doing some projects together, and that's one of the big uh, projects that we're, uh, we we want to organize for next year is try to see how how travel might affect performance, uh, time zone change is very important. We don't change that. The, the biggest uh, difference might be three hours for us, the biggest time to, uh, the time difference between uh, our destination and origin. But uh, how does this affect our game? How does it affect uh, the intensity that the game is played? How does it affect injuries? Um, what is the, you know, the, the, time, the time frame of this, uh, let's say, uh, of, of these effects? So, if you travel on Tuesday and you change time zones, you come back on Thursday, what happens to the week after that? How is your body adapting long term? And these are questions that need to be answered and studies that need to be done. But I'm not in this uh, position right now to say, okay, well, we look at the data and they told us this. And I think in order to get valid insights, you have to look at the at your data carefully. And uh, the professional basketball team, especially in Europe, is not set up to do research. We would love to to evolve into that and get more more staff in and get our own scientists. Right now, we outsource uh, through uh, universities or people that don't work for us. So this it's limiting uh, it's limiting a little bit of what we can do with it with all this data because there's so many questions. Just like you asked, I have more <laughs> questions that need to be answered. But in order to say something positively, I think we, you you have to do the study. And right now, this is this is not done. From a coach that came from, you know, the no data era, like me, <laughs> so I can relate. I totally, you know, I, I I can totally get, you know, what you're saying. Was Is it easy for you to to read the data? And I mean, you say you just outsource, you know, maybe you, you get your insights from, you, you get help. So, so. But is it is it an easy conversation when now when you get the data back or who you know who helps you or who helps explain it to you as a coach? Because I think it's another thing that I think might be a blocker for coaches. You know, it's like I don't understand any of this stuff. I don't know. I need somebody to help me. Who helps you? Well, if that's that's a very valid point because once you are you're even if you're like say unless you're a data scientist, when whenever you open up uh, your laptop and this boom, all these data, the graphs, the, the Excel sheets, the, the CVS sheets, and all that, you're you're overwhelmed. Especially if you never used anything like that before. What does that all mean? And I think it was the same the same with me, of course. And I started my my, my approach when I don't understand something is you know what can I read and who can I ask? So I I went ahead and started reading and went back into my you know stats um, uh, uh, books, and uh, got you know got some courses. Now I'm proud to say I'm I'm in my fifties, and I started my PhD because not because I want to become a professor, but because I'm really uh, I'm really curious about all these questions that we just talked about, and just to do if I'm using something, I want to use it correctly. So uh, what can I read? Or who can I ask? So I had I start asking around, uh, talking to the connection people, of course that that were great of great help and. Uh, start, you know, 
start finding people on, uh, on, in my way that could help me understand the data, understand the, the strengths and weaknesses of these systems, where are the blind spots, what are the problems, which is very important because you see the data and it's presented to you in a very nice way, all, all, you know, no matter the company, but you have to know where, where are the limitations and what you need to know more and how much transfer you, can you infer from this data to practice and, and all that. So uh, in my journey, I was lucky to have some great people around me, some really smart data scientists, bioengineers that, that directed me and, and helped me focus on the things that are important so I can have this, uh, you know, conversations, understand what I'm looking at, work with the data. I don't pretend that I'm this big data scientist that I go into uh, you know, complex analytics, which I don't really need to be, I think, if you have the right team around you. And my role here is, is building teams. And I, this is how I see my, my, myself in the future, you know, being, being part of a, of a larger team. Everybody got the specialty. I know where I'm very good at, where I'm not very good at, but I need to understand everything that's going around me so I can, you know, make the best use of, of this team. So this is how I look my journey uh, um, regarding data as well. Well, you're doing something, right? Because all you do is win. <laughs> I mean, geez, everywhere you go. And, you know, and when you talked about some of the actions you took, especially with the practices, you know, the, the, the intensity and the practices and things like that. But are there any other actions that, that you can mention that has come from your experience now collecting data and then looking at it and, and gaining some insight and then say, OK, we, we need to change this as well? Or are those the big ones that we touched on already? I think these these are the big ones that that we touched. Um, uh, another another thing that we uh, we started looking at is how our our practice content is might be um, affecting our performance in terms of measured by our data, and just strip strip it down to the absolute ne ne to the bare minimum what is absolutely necessary to prepare for a game. Because we had this conversation with the coaches that the way the Euroleague is becoming is I know you want to be well prepared for the game and what that means for the coach is to really practice all his all, all our offenses and defend their offenses so m be very well prepared in what we're going to face and i told them that this is a uh, you know the way it's becoming now with all the travel and the frequency of the game is becoming a, a game of energy and unfortunately you have to pick your your what you're going to focus on because you can't really prepare the team for any situation that that is going to be presented on the court something that was happening 10 years ago when the league was had a different format we play less games less intensive games so you were able to prepare uh, better so by by measuring our 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 drills by you know kind of playing around with different practice time drill times and durations we were able to strip it down to the bare minimum i think that was another big uh big uh, insight that we got from data and how can we prepare the team tactically but also have the energy to execute because we were going into games very often very well prepared but not being able to execute we looked slow we looked tired it took us two three days to recover from a game so i think that was a big uh, a big help too um in terms of how we change the ways that we that we function well and you know you mentioned it the fact that, I mean, your system is only as good as its limitations. And so, you, you know, the fact that you're questioning things, I, and I'm curious to find out from you like, what you think is still missing. You know, is there, is there something, what kind of data or, or anything that, that we could, you could use in the, in the future? What might still be missing? Well, what's missing? What, what's missing would be the, what is the effect of all the, the external, the, of the external load? What is the effect on the body? And how can we measure it? Because right now we're, we use proxy measures, distance, acceleration, but no one tells us what is actually happening in the body. Yeah, there's techniques like inverse dynamics and you can calculate ground reaction forces and, and see the different stresses that, that, that the limbs are getting, your legs or left or right, and, and try to see if, you're, if there are any balances there and when this is over a limit and that will put you in danger of you know, worse performance and injury. Uh, but uh, that's, I think, the big, the next big step of of data is really trying to understand all these numbers, all these metrics. Or how do they affect me? And if we were able to to really get this insight, and also another thing that that it's uh, I think necessary is to get get all the algorithms to to allow for more personalization and individualization of the, the measurements, and not have this kind of uh, zones that kind of everybody's kind of like fitting there and just be more individualized. I think this is going to be a big, uh, a big uh, step 
also to maybe unify one the metrics because different companies use different metrics that with don't they don't have specific units for example and uh, they're a little bit of arbitrary and a lot of black box uh uh information over there but yeah there's like we said this is this is a work in progress and that's what i told our management when they asked should we jump in i said for sure you have to jump in is it perfect no is it, we need we need proof but there's no proof we're we're part of it we're 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 trying to explore something that is fairly new and uh, try to give our insights in, in, in the, you know, in terms of practitioners, what we need so the companies can really adjust and learn from us and we can learn from them to actually make a, a product that is going to be much more accurate, much more useful to the athletes and to, to us. That is uh, some great insight right there. This has been, this has been phenomenal coach and you know i just want to throw this out there is there anything that i didn't touch on that you think is important that we mention uh while i have you here no i think we, we cover mostly uh m most of the things that that we we you know said to discuss in the beginning i think the european experience uh is interesting because it's it's a, it's pretty unique it's different than the u.s uh experience one thing that i would like to add is that you know, data is uh, is a great way to make your case and, and to get insights and understand your work, but it has to be uh, holistic. It ha you ha we have to collect information from many sources, and then take the information, sit on our desk, and and really ask ourselves, what does this really mean? How can it help me? And and how can this be applied to my situation? And not try to get because that's also a misunderstanding that we're going to get something on the screen that's going to give us a direct answer that. We can then transfer on on the on, in our practice, and that's not the case. It, it, you know, data like all knowledge is a journey. Uh, that's one thing. And the other thing is that, like I mentioned in the beginning, is that if we want any if we want any positive uh, outcomes to, uh, from from our uh, from our data, we need to create a culture in the team that everybody is respecting it, everybody is is, is participating, everybody is uh, informed about what we are doing and contributing. Otherwise, it's just going to be me looking at a screen and then saying something to coach. And I don't think it's worth the time or the money. That is phenomenal. Coach, if somebody wanted to reach out to you, if they heard something they want to ask you about, how can they get a hold of you? Um, they can find me on uh, social uh, on social, social media, as everybody does these days, Costas underscore Hadzi Christos. And um, I think that's the best way. Hit me up, uh, DM me, and uh, I'm always available. I'm always answering questions. So if somebody want to reach out for any of the stuff that we talked or any other um, uh, topics, I'm always available. Hey, before we get out of here, I got to ask you, were you on the bench when Greece beat Team USA with the uh, baby Shaq and uh, big, big Sofu tearing us up? Were you? Unfortunately, I was not. I saw it on TV. But my connection to this team is that I have been the, the personal trainer of big Sofu for 10 years. And we he's, went from, uh, from when he was 21 years old till he kind of finished his career and we were together and, and we prepared together for this uh, tournament in the summer and I was this was the highlight of the the peak of Greek basketball beating beating the Americans with all this team that it is unbeatable basically right so we played the perfect game the U.S. didn't play well so we ended up beating them Shaq baby Shaq had an amazing game and unfortunately I was not there I saw the TV but, but I mean, you know, LeBron's on that team, D Wade, Chris Paul. I mean, that, and when you go back and watch that, I think it's a 30 for 30 uh, that ESPN did on that team. I mean, that literally is what upended Team USA. That win, that that team, you know, baby Shaq. I mean, they did that. They completely just upended the you know, everything about Team USA. Yeah, it's one of those sports miracles, I guess, because if you look at the, uh, you know, Coach Zizewski is the coach, right? And not, let's not forget the coaches. I don't remember who else was, but I'm sure it was a stellar coaching staff. All these guys were in D Wade, LeBron, and here's, you know, some guys from Greece that nobody knew about. Well, we knew about these, these players, obviously, because it's, it's our world. And this is probably the best generation of Greek basketball in one team. Great guards, uh, great centers, great, great. Uh, forwards. Each each person on this team was really one of the best. Uh, they were some of the best players in Europe, and they played their best. You know the best game of this game. So there's no other way to win. Your 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 much better opponent must play mediocre, and you must play great in order to have a chance. And this was our day, and it was and it it really boosted basketball in Greece uh, as well. And uh, that's also important for us. It's U.S. Yeah, lost a game. Uh, he lost a game, and that changed a lot. I, I'm I'm sure. 
but it also helped uh, European basketball and Greek basketball to attract more kids, more interest, and and continue this legacy of of success. And I'm sure there's a lot of people sitting here going, "Is he going to ask about Giannis?" And yes, I'm going to ask about Giannis. Uh, have have you? I mean, I know you had but your experience with Giannis. Okay, so I knew all the brothers when they were really young. My first, so I, I was obviously I was working in Greece before I moved to Russia and started traveling the world again. Uh, and I, I I trained. I was in a professional basketball team. But I also train uh, players on the side, with, on the side, which I love to do. I love to train. I like to spend my days in the weight room and and try new things and working with with young athletes. So an agent calls me one day and, call, and said, "You know what? I got this kid. You won't believe. He's 16 years old, super athletic. He's the oldest of of uh, of uh, four brothers from Nigeria." Now. Another fact about like how life sometimes connect things. I have a connection with Nigeria. My father was working there. He passed away there, uh, sadly. So Nigeria is, is something that is too much, you know, very familiar and too, too close to my heart. So I said, okay, well, let's, let's do it. He said, yeah, he's an immigrant. They were immigrant kids, so not a lot of you know, resources. I said, all right, bring the kids. So Thanasis comes in. And he's, you know, he's young Thanasis, uh, super athletic working his, his tail off uh, and then he's he's trying to make it and and then I meet the other brothers and the other brother is Yanis. So he said, you should see the other kid. Yanis is a, he was what, like 6'1", like skinny little kid, super quiet. Didn't, uh, Athanasis was completely the opposite. He always, uh, like, you know, many friends around him doing things. Yanis was just, he was just doing and being silent, catching the bus to two hours to his house and back to our gym and all that. So I, I interacted with him a little bit when he was younger, and then uh, we trained in the summer sometimes. But then she she moved out and she went to to Spain and then moved to the states. Didn't have so much time with him. I had much more time with Anas. I had a very good relationship with them. Uh, Costa and uh, and then Alex were too young. I didn't even see them back then. But the picture I had with Giannis was this little skinny kid. He had a, a red uniform on all the time from his previous team, and just being silent and looking at you in the eye and and executing. Nobody believed that he's going to become what he became, obviously, but it's just a great honor just to have been around him. And, and he's doing so much for, for Greece and Greek basketball and basketball in general. So I'm super grateful. Then I saw him when he was older, he came to train in my facility. I had a facility in Greece with his, with his uh, box stuff, uh, Suki Hobson, his strength coach. And they came to and use the facility, and it was just a, a delight just to see him, what she became. Super nice guy, polite to everybody, taking pictures with all the kids. And if you didn't follow basketball, and you wouldn't know he was famous. It was just, it was great. Oh, that's a, I don't know if you ever saw that one. Uh, it's a quick little clip somebody did. Somebody would go around and ask people, like, if they're in nice cars, like, ah, hey, how did you make all your money? And he doesn't, he has no idea, Giannis. <laughs> and he walks out, Giannis looks oh, that I, up and I, just, I, I know, I know that, that account on Instagram or, or TikTok, but did she, did she get Giannis? I didn't see that one. Did she get did, did, yeah. He walks up to his car and Giannis is in the passenger seat and he walks up. He's like, hey, man, he's like, how did you, how'd you, how'd you make all your money? And Giannis looks at him and he goes, crypto. <laughs> I just saw that. That's funny. <laughs> oh, it's great. Like, it, you know, and so it just kind of tells you, you know, uh, what kind of guy he is. And it also, I mean, we got some great insight from you today, coach. And, you know, just watching your videos and things, I could not wait to talk to you. And I can't wait to have you back. I mean, I can sit here. We, we need more than 45 minutes or so because, man, you, know, you have just your experience and, and the players you've worked with, you know, on the professional level and in Europe and then also, you know, here in the States and everything you've done, um, you know, and for you to take the time to, uh, to join us today, I can't thank you enough. Well, I appreciate all the good works. It was a pleasure. And uh, yeah. Until we meet again. All right. If you know a great coach like Costas doing great things, winning games, and doing it with sports data and analytics, we'd love to hear about him. We'll even make him a guest on the podcast. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Connexon Sports or look for us on LinkedIn at Connexon Sports and Media. Remember, we want you to innovate the game by collecting the data, getting the insights, and then turning those insights into action. We'll see you next time.